Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started just because I have a lot of really great um, folks who are going to share some of their experiences with open education with you. And I want to make sure we give them a lot of time to, to do that. Um, my name is Anna Bendo, and I am the Director of Affordable Learning at OhioLINK. Um, and for those of you that are not in the state of Ohio, OhioLINK is the Higher Education Library Consortium in the state. So pretty much most of the um, public and uh, independent colleges in the state are all part of our Higher Education Library Consortium. And so I get the opportunity to work with a lot of librarians, um, particularly on um, uh, different uh, affordable learning strategies. And OER is one of the ones that we do like to focus on. But this particular program that I'm going to talk about here and that the faculty are going to share is a really great opportunity for us to work with faculty in the state um, on trying to help um, bring open education into their classrooms for many of the different reasons um, that I'm sure you all know about. Um, I'm going to let each individual faculty member introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their institution and, and what they do there when they get to that. Um, but uh, so you'll hear more specifically about what they're working on and what their specific project was when they get to their section. So just to give you a little bit of background on the program that we're going to be talking about today, um, OhioLINK sponsors an OER course redesign grant for faculty in the state. And basically this um, idea was born out of Cleveland State's um, Summer Institute where they worked with faculty on OER and Ohio Dominican University, another institution in the state had a similar program where they were working with faculty to try to convert co courses to more open materials. And so we decided we wanted to do something like that at the state level for institutions that possibly didn't have funding for this type of thing on their own campus. So what we do is we have a cohort of faculty, uh, generally around 28 to 30 each time, and they select one um, course that they want to explore uh, OER options for. And so they send us a syllabus um, and they let us know kind of why this course they think might be a good fit and why they're interested in exploring OER options for that course. And then they spend about a month attending an asynchronous symposium or online course, learning a little bit about OER and what some of the uh, advantages might be to switching to that. And then um, kind of getting some help from specific OER librarians on where are some resources that they might start. So these OER librarians look at their syllabi and say, oh, I see you're using this. Here's a place you might wanna start. Here's a suggestion. So it's a really great way that they don't kind of have the entire Google world or uh, stratosphere of, of all the OER resources out in the world to start um, searching. They get kind of a targeted list of somewhere they might be able to start. We're running our fifth cohort this spring. So we started in spring of 2022 and we're now um, starting our fifth cohort on Monday. And at the end of this cohort, so in summer 2024, we will have had 145 faculty members from 49 different Ohio institutions of higher education that will have participated in this grant. And if all of those 145 faculty members convert their course to OER, then more than 24,500 students would have the potential to save one and a half million dollars. Now, recognizing that not everyone is going to be able to find something perfect and switch their course, course to OER, but the impact is great if all of those folks, or at least, you know, some of those folks decide to make that change. And then cost savings is only one of the many benefits that we're looking at for students. So many of these faculty members talk about increased uh, retention, um, increased uh, completion of their course, how they were actually able to make the course content more tailored for their students because they could pick and choose materials that really worked. So there's a lot of other benefits that we are finding um, from these uh, course conversions as well. Uh, so we hope to continue to run this grant. So if you are a faculty member or you're a librarian at an institution in Ohio and you feel like you might have faculty members that would benefit from this, um, we will do another one in fall of 2024. So please be on the lookout for that on any of Ohio Link's um, website or social um, media platforms or any of the places that you get information from Ohio Link, or you can reach out to me directly and I can give you the info. 
So what I'm going to do now is have um, four faculty members that went through this course redesign program in the fall talk to you about what their experience was. And then we're actually lucky today that we have another person. He was not a recipient of this grant, but actually created an OER. Um, so he has that kind of experience to draw from, and he's going to share that with us as well. So those are the folks that we'll be sharing with you. And then if you have any questions at the end, we're hoping to kind of have a panel discussion, or I have some questions that they all could answer um, as well. So kind of keep those in mind as we're going through, jot them down so that you can ask your questions at the end. Okay, so we are going to start with uh, Michelle you has, who is at Lorain County. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay. So um, I teach at Lorraine Community College, and I teach very specifically in the sonography program, but I am also the ALHN coordinator, which means that I'm in charge of all the prerequisites of all the health allied health careers. And we had a huge initiative uh, because a lot of these courses are college credit plus courses as well. So high schools are teaching these prerequisites. We're teaching them at the college. And we had a lot of issues with um, high dropout rate, high failure rate, um, um, just a lot of problems overall with new book editions, vendors not getting back to us in time, book editions weren't being adopted at the high schools. Some of our instructors didn't have the new editions. There was all kinds of issues we had. So this was a big push uh, looking into OERs. And when the grant came available, I applied for it right away and received it, luckily. And um, I had actually did it four times, three or four times in a row, I think three. Um, and Ohio Link has been fantastic. And Anna's and her um, and Mandy have been wonderful in helping. Um, but we were able to eliminate overall four books and I'm working on a fifth one. Um, and this has made a huge difference for our high school students as well as our college students. So um, can we go to the next slide? Great. So why adopt the OERs? Well, one of the big problems was we had rising book costs every year. Books that went from $75 to $100 to $125 a course. And that was an issue and keeping up with the constant new additions. Even though this material wasn't changing that much, there were always new additions. And so people were having to buy new books. Administration was looking to reduce expenditures and budget costs, and our high schools couldn't keep up with the new additions. Many high schools were buying a, a group of books for their students and teaching the College Credit Plus class, and then they were stuck with an old edition when the new edition came out. We also had a lot of issues with course completion and retention. And the number one issue was that students were not buying the books and they were having financial aid issues um, and not able to get their material until sometimes the third week of the course. Um, and so with the OER, we have that material available um, on day one. And so that was a big one. Um, and so, you know, not just rising costs, but ease of use was another issue. So some of the challenges that we did face was you know, the integrity of the material was questionable in some cases, and a lot of times it didn't really meet what we were teaching. Um, and so I needed help in doing research. Um, the Ohio League people were fantastic and helped me do a lot of research for uh, potential opportunities or or open um, links. Uh, but um, some of the issues where we didn't have traditional PowerPoints, which was what we were used to, or test banks, or even resource materials for um, new instructors. Um, there wasn't a lot of time to develop a course. When I took and turned an OER course into a common course at Learning Community College, it took me almost a year. And that was because I had other teaching commitments. So that time frame of working on it every week took one full year. And we had a slow integration where our high school uh, was a semester behind. Um, there weren't a lot of online resources for specific classes. It was easier to do with the more common class. MedTerm was super easy because almost everybody teaches medical terminology. However, as I found, I went through this process, the more specific the class, the harder it was to find one OER. Um, and so in doing this, um, the first time around was the easiest. I took the most general, largest enrolled class and we used one OER that was great for everything. Then we needed two OERs for the next course. And now the next course that I'm doing is taking almost four OERs. So I'm having to piece it together and that's becoming more complex. 
Uh, students and faculty both embraced the open educational resources. Um, we weren't fighting with the bookstore anymore. A lot of times our bookstore, and I'm not sure if this is system wide or if this is everywhere, but they tend to order fewer books than students. And so we had students who couldn't, even though they had financial aid or even though they had the money, couldn't get the books on day one. Or we had students who were waiting for financial aid to kick in. And so we ended up having students who or had access to our material on day one, but didn't have the books until like week three. Um, so the bookstore, we stopped fighting with the bookstore. We have more timely submissions and more submissions on day one because students are jumping right in when they realize they don't have to buy a book. They're on board and they're participating. Um, all our faculty are using a single site or version. We don't have to worry about what edition the, the vendor has come out with. Have we adopted it? Are we current? And then the ease of use. What we found is students have said that they can easily use Control F to find information on any source, or they can cut and paste information and put it into papers. So using the source um, for the open educational resource in the course has made a fantastic um, course completion increase and student participation. So the most positive results we saw were increased course completion and success rates. Um, that's growing as we continue to adopt. Um, what I had to do was build a shell course, which was kind of a common course that had the OER and the basic material and the links and the material itemized. But then we allow each individual instructor to take that common course and add to it what they want. That way everybody's using at least the very minimum of content. Um, I have used a lot of librarian assistance for OER. Um, the Ohio Link people have been fantastic, but I've also leaned on our own librarian, Chris Sheets. She's been fantastic. She's done a lot of groundwork for me. And then the College Credit Plus uh, has helped significantly. We have more and more students applying for and taking College Credit Plus. So we have such a growing need for for these students to get into healthcare careers, careers quickly and getting them in quickly means that they have to take these in the high school so they can jump into our programs right away. And if the books are free at the high school level, then we've got more students participating. Some of the negative results we've seen is that people are not always happy with the change. I've got instructors who've got 30 years plus teaching and they, they didn't really understand the OER. They were, they were resistant to change. They wanted the test bank. They wanted the... PowerPoints, they wanted all that instructor resource material. Um, it did take a long ad adoption time and implementation time. Um, there is a major commitment to completion, of course, using either one or multiple OER sources. So um, with the first one, I, I was able to use one link, one source. With the second course, I had to use two. With this third course, I'm using four. So there's a lot of jumping around and I'm afraid it's gonna get confusing. Um, and then you just don't have any more printed material at test banks or PowerPoints or instructional aids. And so that was something that a lot of instructors relied on that they have to now do on their own. But they can do it. I'm sure they can do it. They do just fine. Um, so an overview, since 2021 at LCC, we've adopted OER for five courses. Um, and this is only in Allied Health. This is not English, biology, or anywhere else, but only in Allied Health. Um, instructor time and resources, it did take a lot of my time personally because I had to build these common shell courses for every course I was building so that any faculty who came into it knew what we were using. Um, the book savings costs, I tallied just an average. And over the last year, getting the four courses online, we've saved over $100,000 per year in just these courses alone. We are seeing increased course completion. Um, and so that's helpful with um, you know, SSI money and things like that and reimbursement. Student faculty and uh, student and faculty feedback was positive overall. And administrative and research support is essential. Um, our administrative is very supportive, our administration is, but unfortunately they don't offer a lot of time or money. So a lot of it was done on my own time and money, um, which was hard. So I'm reaching out for this last one that's harder to get more support. Um, and depending on the course, you may need one site, you may need multiple sites. Uh, but in order to create a substantial, a substantial course or a course with content, you may need to find multiple sources. Um, and that's my story. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for me?
Why don't we do Michelle, just so we make sure we get everyone. We'll have people either yeah, put sure. questions Absolutely. in the chat or I'm just, gonna um, hang out. just hold on to them. Yep. And then we'll uh, answer at the end. Thank you so much. Uh, you've done amazing work uh, with your program and we are very grateful for all of that work that you've put in on your own time. Um, okay. Next, we are going to hear from uh, Genevieve Richie Ewing. All right. So can everybody hear me now? <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, so I'm from Central State University. It's a historically black college university. Um, we have a huge number of um, first generation college students. And so we faced many of the same issues that Michelle was just talking about in terms of um, students not having the money to get books right away, even if they had financial aid. Our bookstore also uh, in some cases wouldn't order books at all until the students actually asked for them. Um, and then students, since they were first generation, often didn't know that they needed to get to pay for textbooks because in high school you don't pay for textbooks. So we've had a big push at Central State to incorporate more OER. Um, the course that I used for the Ohio Link grant was Forensic Anthropology. So I received a National Science Foundation grant um, to increase our forensic offerings. And forensic anthropology was one of those courses. It's the one I personally am teaching. There are two other courses that we are also searching for OERs um, for as well, forensic psychology and forensic social work. And all of these are part of a minor. So the thing with forensic anthropology is um, it's a highly specialized course. So forensic anthropology is when you're looking at skeletal remains for law enforcement agencies. So it's a really specialized field. And that means that the books are extremely expensive. So 200 to $300 for a forensic anthropology book. Um, I know our students and our students were not going to be able to pay that amount for a forensic anthropology book. I, however, was very skeptical about what I was going to be able to find. It does require extensive skeletal knowledge, so I definitely needed something that students could use to look at the bones. It needed images. It needed to have all of the human bones in it. And I really didn't know if there was going to be an OER that would be available that would help me with this course. So that was why I applied for the grant. We actually found an OER textbook that covers osteology, so the study of bones, which shocked me, and I am very great, grateful to Ohio Link for doing that. There's images and text about all of the bones in the human skeleton. So this was extremely useful for my class. It also has chapters on aging and sexing skeletal remains. So in forensic anthropology, um, when you're dealing with skeletal remains in terms of law enforcement, what they're want is a biological profile. So you need to give them an age range, tell them if this person was biologically male or female, um, stature. So these are all techniques that I need to teach my students. And this OER textbook actually has some of those techniques. It covers about 70% of my course material. So I was super happy to be able to do that too. Um, they came up with a couple of others as well that had a chapter about forensic anthropology, which I'm using more as an introduction. I do still need to create some material on my own, the labs in particular, this is a four credit course, so it's a lab course. And the labs I will have to create on my own, but having this osteology textbook will be very useful for the students during those labs, because um, a lot of the labs are going to be them practicing identifying bones and figuring out aging and sexing. And so if they have that access, that immediate access to that OER textbook, that's going to be hugely useful to them in these labs as well as the rest of the course material. So what else did I learn through this Ohio Link OER course redesign grant? It's a really long name. Um, <laughs> I now have a much better understanding of OER types and categories. Um, I had used OER and we had switched over to OER for some of our introductory courses like introductory sociology and social problems. And that's great, but those are very commonly taught courses. And so the OER textbooks were pretty easy to find. This course in particular 
had a, such specialized knowledge that I needed in that textbook that it was really nice um, to see the variety of OER available. And that gave me more hope for finding OER in terms of the, the other forensic courses, the forensic psychology and the forensic social work. It was wonderful to work with Anna and Mandy and Ohio Link. Um, they were really great and enthusiastic. And then um, I never really thought of piecing together OER to work for more specialized classes like this. Uh, previously, like I said, I had just looked for a textbook. And for the introductory tech classes, that works great. But when I'm doing a more specialized class, I really hadn't considered piecing things together like this. And so um, finding some sources that work and then knowing I'm going to have to create other sources still takes a load off of the course creation. Um, luckily for me, this was from the start. So I was I'm creating this course this summer. So having that textbook already there with osteology um, I know that I've got that, and then it'll make creating the course after that much easier. So the last things I wanted to talk about in my journey, um, it was really nice to interact with other faculty who have an interest in OER, and it helped me see the wide variety of uses. We had faculty in my cohort that were using OER in a huge variety of classes, and it was nice to know that there was OER out there. Um, it did, I had to review an OER as part of the grant. Um, so I reviewed the osteology textbook and that really helped me clarify what I was looking for in an OER for this class. And then aligning the OER with the course objectives and the course schedule gave me a jump start in creating the course. So I know now, you know, as I create this course over the summer that I already have good pieces of it in place. I will have to write the labs and figure out what I'm doing with those, but I already have the course objectives and the course schedule um, all connected to the osteology textbook. And so I've got, you know, 30% of the course already done and the planning stage is already done. And that was really helpful um, to know as I'm starting to create this course over the summer. I think that was it, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Genevieve. Um, it's amazing to hear, you know, a course, it's always tricky with a course that's so specialized because a lot of them are really expensive course materials. Yes. So I'm really um, thrilled to hear that you're having some success with, with finding something that will work there because that, that can be one of the biggest challenges in the OER world. So thanks for all of your hard work and for sharing that with us. Sure. All right. Next we have Megan Donaldson. Hi. Hi, I'm Megan. I'm from the University of Dayton. And um, so I teach in the English department, but the course that I used for this grant um, experience was, um, it's called Health Literacy and Social Justice. And it's for, primarily, it's going to be for people who are going into healthcare careers, um, but also any students who have an interest in health equity, social justice issues, um, and that sort of thing. So um, for me, it wasn't the the kind of push to look into OER wasn't really about cost. I had um, a health literacy textbook that I was using that um, has, has not been revised. So the bonus of that is that students could find a used copy pretty cheap. So cost wasn't a huge issue. The problem was there didn't seem to be any textbook that was going to combine health literacy as a research topic and kind of how it can be useful for public health officials with the social justice and kind of advocacy for health equity component. So I just didn't find anything, you know, free or otherwise that was going to do all of that. Um, so I was already <laughs> scrambling each semester to try to find things that were up to date, incredible, um, using the textbook really to just establish a framework of health literacy. Um, and I, so I was really determined to find a way to not ask them to buy that when each semester I found myself using less and less of that textbook. Um, partly because the case studies, it has wonderful case studies in it, but they're very outdated. I started to realize that for my students, it was like asking them to learn a history lesson and then apply um, all of these concepts to it. Things that were <laughs> familiar to me, um, obviously were not, you know, this was like all new information to them, but these are even health issues. So, um, so it was really the challenge of, you know, even if there wasn't even a perfect textbook, even if I felt comfortable asking students to buy it. And then, of course, even at UD, we have this kind of image of students being pretty privileged, but we have a surprising amount of 
food insecurity um, with students with pretty significant um, financial barriers. So that's always a consideration for me. Uh, so the the one of the major benefits of doing the program was just as a lecturer, I teach a four four load and. You're, you're really just trying to get um, um, to sort of look ahead to revise the course for the future semester. Um, and, and this, you know, little to um, kind of make the mental space to work on, on that. Um, let me try to close some other things because it says my. So, Megan, you're kind of going in and out a bit. I don't know if you want to turn your video off to see if that helps with okay. just the, the uh, bandwidth so we can at least hear you for now. Okay. Yeah, let's try that. Um, so the biggest thing was kind of that this uh, stipend was allowing me to kind of dedicate the mental space <laughs> to really focusing on this course. Um, when I don't always have the opportunity to do that. You know, I'm trying to figure out if there's anything else I can do to fix this. Um, we can hear you now. Okay, okay yep. good. Um, and the other kind of biggest benefit was just focused help from a librarian who was experienced with this, um, partly because it's, you know, this like two different topics and then kind of there's a lot of related topics that aren't really listed in that course title. Um, Mandy was really good about suggesting other things that, you know, once she said, you know, advocacy, public health, health equity, kind of all these other terms, I thought, oh, that's great. But I would never have had time to do a search in like every platform where you can find OERs on every one of those terms. So um, working with Mandy helped me kind of skip some of the hours and hours it would have taken me to, to find those things. Um, I also found the course map where we kind of sort of rebuild everything from the ground up with the OER was really useful. I was kind of resistant at first because I thought, you know, this is just not the format that I use to do this when I'm designing my own course. Um, but it ended up being really helpful to do, you know, what I always do, linking outcomes to assessments, but then to link the materials to those two other pieces helped me to see um, you know, what I was able to cover during the program and where in the future I might need to try to find some more things. Um, but overall, um, I found several different things that were really helpful. One is um, a book called Public Health Ethics from, this is through National Library of Medicine. Um, and this was much more recent case studies than what was in the textbook. So this has been really helpful, um, really easy to just give students a link to read instead of, you know, textbook pages. Um, and it also came with really great discussion questions to help me kind of flesh out, you know, what we were able to do with those case studies. Um, and the other big one was an, an ebook on activism for students and advocacy through Open Washington Press books. And this was, I had, I had never seen anything that was kind of from a credible source but free that was going to give students really up-to-date ideas about what is this, what does this look like? I think students are often really overwhelmed thinking activism has to mean like a sign and a march um, and there's a lot more they can do. So that was, has been really helpful in helping them think small, how you kind of start small with, um, with making change in the industries and causes that you care about. Um, so that, that has been really helpful and students really enjoyed um, what that added to our you know, conversation. Um, and then of course, having this kind of rubric that we use to review um, for the course, you know, for the program, we did one review, but of course, having those in mind was really helpful as I looked at a lot of different things. Um, and of course, there's always something to be said for kind of being pushed to write out your answers to those things, even if you don't think you need to. Um, and that helped me articulate a little bit better where there are, you know, maybe this isn't the most perfect thing ever, but it has, you know, nine out of 10 of these criteria. And so that helped me to, to I think, prepare to continue looking for more OER in the future, um, having that rubric as a way of thinking, it's not just, you know, it's not just like credible in a general way and up to date in a vague general way, but what are the other ways we can look closely, more closely at that and make sure it's really um, 
it's really kind of up to the standards and some of the paid resources that we would usually, you know, kind of be able to rely on having done that um, vetting of information. So um, I think those were, I think those were kind of the basics that I wanted to share. I found it really useful for kind of a strange course where nothing was already out there waiting for me. Um, I wish there was something out there that was perfect for this combination of kind of two concepts, but um, this program was really helpful for me to piece together things that were of higher quality than what I was piecing together before. Yeah. Thank you. That is, it's very um, kind of reassuring to hear the, the, the main reasons that we um, kind of started this program in the first place was kind of to give people that dedicated time and money to say, you know, if I'm getting this small stipend, I can say, I'm going to set this time aside and I'm going to focus on this one course. And Cause you know, we all get so busy mm -hmm. in our work that it's hard to, to carve that time out. And then also hearing, um, how useful it was to work with a librarian, um, particularly Mandy, who's so great at this work, but I'm sure on your campuses, um, there's someone, uh, that, you know, could help with some of that kind of narrowing down at least of all the resources that are out there. So thank you so much for sharing your work and, and telling us a little bit more about that. And I'm glad you're having some success as well. Thank you. Uh, okay, next we have Xiao Li. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Xiao Li Li. Uh, I'm an associate professor of English from uh, University of Dayton. So Maggie and I, were colleagues, you know, they're, we're kind of neighbors. Uh, <laughs> Well, so here is my story. And the course I, for this grant, the course I'm uh, redesigned is called uh, English 270 Reading and Writing in an American University. And so I've been assigned to teach this class in the last three summers. This is a summer course we created just for a special group of the students who are from China and then from Shanghai Normal University who are at UD and to try to finish their senior year. And so in, at the end, they are going to get two degrees, one degree from the Shanghai Normal University and then another a bachelor's degree from University of Dayton. And because they are getting a degree from UD and that's why they, they have to take the, like the English course in which is similar to a English 100 or English 200 class we offered it to all first year and second year students at UD. And so uh, for my students, and this is offered in the summer, and then typically from July the 1st to um, August, the, the first week of August. So it's a five-week course, and uh, then it's a four-credit hour course, and then I'm tasked to teach them is to include both uh, English 100 and 200, and also make them very easily to transit to a technical writing class I teach in the fall semester. And then this is my 13th year at University of Dayton. And then in the past uh, many summers, and I was assigned to take students outside to do the study abroad. And so in the, re uh, but then every fall uh, semester, I have to teach a tech writing class to the, this group of the students. And then now I'm teaching the summer class. And then in fall, I teach the uh, tech writing class. And so special group of the students. And then uh, when I got the grant, and thanks to Mandy, and she sent me a list of the, the materials I could use for my class. And uh, then the thing is that people always think that this is a 100 English, English writing class, and, right? And the materials they use are typically for the freshman students, and then American uh, domestic students, freshman students, or another type of the uh, materials you can easily find. They are the ESL. Yes, so writing or second language writing uh, materials. And then, well, for my students is that they are seniors, but this is their first semester in the, uh, in the American University uh, on the US uh, campus. And so their semester in China and in late June, and then within a few days, and then they fly to Dayton. And then still they're struggling with uh, uh, the jet lag and then living, finding a place to live and finding the place to get food. And then find the transportation because they were from a big Mac city to a small town in Dayton. And so lots of things and they have adjusted to. And also is that uh, academically, they have to learn to read and write in English. And so that's a huge, uh, lots of things they have to do. And uh, they also is that they have to find the textbooks 
And um, in the past uh, three years, two years, is that uh, because of the COVID, the students couldn't come to the campus because of the travel restrictions. And so we, I had to promote, put things together and put it online and send to them. And then within five weeks, typically it would take my students a much longer time to read the, the course materials. And so they were trying to get the material to them on July 1st when they first got here and they read uh, was not that practical. And so I thought that this grant is that with the information I can put set up the course now and then it's, now the course is available in Canvas. That's a school a course management tool. And so the students have access to the course materials. They can prepare before they arrive and then use the materials. And uh, so uh, for me is that I was trying, uh, I'm a technical writer by training. And so that's why for technical writing, there are two very fundamental concepts. One is audience analysis. And the second thing is that user experience. And so. For my goals of applying for the uh, redesign the course and using the OER is that just for those kind of the reasons, thinking about it, my audience and thinking about the what experience they can get out of this class. And uh, so first of all, I would just say in the past, the, I had the complaints from the Chinese students about the textbook, the cost of the textbook. And so it's more like the 10 times more than they typically pay for a textbook, right? And they, well, the main issue is really is that this is such a small group of students and engineering students, their senior year, and then the English language learners. And so there's no publisher and see that kind of the financial gain in customizing the textbooks for this small group of the students, right? And uh, so with this and the grant, I was able to put like the get information from 12 different sources and uh, they put them into the course management tool and then uh, I got the materials for reading and the writing and then the in-class activities. And so that the students have access to them before they get here. And uh, so I'm, I will teach this class this summer. And then I'm sure that I will just do a post uh, uh, class survey and to get more information from my students, how they react to the course redesign. And so I think that's all I would like to share with the group. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's so nice to hear how such a kind of a specific, you know, student population has this need and that you were able to um, kind of meet that and, and change it up a little bit so that it that it works better for them. And I am very excited to follow up with you at the end of summer and see how it went and hear what your students thought and if, um, if you... Uh, made some progress on sure. kind of some of those things that you wanted to. So thank you so much for sharing. Okay. And um, next, I, I cannot claim this person as one of our own uh, grant recipients, but I can say that he um, is a faculty member at an Ohio Link institution and is doing great work uh, with OER. And he's going to tell us about his experience and um, kind of what, what he's done to help his students. So Justin Sevenker. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Anna. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi, folks. My name is Justin Sevenker. I'm an English faculty member at Lorain County Community College. Um, I direct the Writing Center, and I'm the outgoing writing program coordinator. I just sort of finished my stint. Um, and so while I was program coordinator uh, for our writing program, uh, I chaired a committee of English faculty who were interested in creating an OER textbook for our um, co college composition sequence. We have um, English 161, which is required for essentially every student at Lorain County Community College, and then students who are earning their AA or AS and want to transfer to a four-year institution usually have to take the second course as well, English 162. Um, so this group of faculty wanted to replace our standard print textbook um, with a free um, OER textbook. Um, and the motivations for doing that were the same that everybody else on this on this panel has been talking about. Um, because English 161 in particular is required for every student on campus, um, the standard textbook we were using um, was a print text. Um, even though the publisher worked with us on pricing, it was still um, uh, upwards of $50 for students. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we could alleviate that cost for uh, for students. And, and then there are also the, the added benefits of no longer being tied to the publisher's revision cycle of new editions and having to upend our, our syllabi and assignments and things like that. And um, just wanting the opportunity to be able to tailor a textbook to the particular assignments um, in our curriculum 
the particular needs of our students on our campus. And so um, we decided to undertake this work and we knew it was going to be a big project um, to create one OER that could be used in dozens and dozens of sections of these college composition courses um, by many, many instructors. Uh, we have about 40 full-time and part-time instructors teaching composition on LCC's campus, and we have an equal number of instructors in the local high schools teaching CCP versions of these courses. And so um, we wanted to create a really wonderful resource that would cover both of those college composition courses and be able to be used by all of these instructors and all of um, and all of these sections. Um, it was a long process. It was a four-year process. Um, we were really lucky. I know folks at other institutions who have been um, mandated to make a switch over to OER and have had to do so very, very quickly. Um, we were lucky that we did. We were not in that situation. We were able to take our time and produce a text that we were really proud of. Um, we were able to spend some time early on um, reaching out to others who have done this work to learn from them, surveying what's out there. Um, and then it was a three year process of actually writing our, our own OER. Um, this last fall, we actually launched it. So, so it's only been out there for a year. Um, I was very happy a few weeks into the fall semester that uh, my inbox was pretty empty in terms of students and instructors emailing me to tell me that something about the OER was exploding or destroying their class or something like that. There were no disaster stories. Um, so it was, uh, I think that those four years that went into creating the OER, it was time well spent because we did create a resource that it seems like is working really, really well for our writing program. And I'm looking forward. Um, I know that when we get a few more semesters along, um, I really feel like we'll be able to look back at, at the data to see how uh, how um, using a resource like that is, um, I hope, uh, you know, affecting our success rates in a really positive way because we do have students for whom it is a financial burden to buy a textbook. Um, uh, and, and so um, the fact that they're able to have that text right away on the first day of class and get started with the material, I, I, I think is just a wonderful boon for these students. Um, I am going to put the link. Oh, somebody else already put the link to the textbook in the chat for me. Thank you very much, Mandy. That's great. Um, so so the, the textbook is, is there in the chat if you folks would like to look at it. It's just hosted on textbook, and so it's available um, for anybody to look at and to use. Um, I do just want to talk a little bit about the contents of the textbook um, as a way of talking about the process of writing it, um, because college composition is a really a very common course um, across not only Ohio, but, but the country. Um, we had a lot of OERs out there that we could survey and pull from as we were, as we were putting our textbook together. So you'll see the first large chunk of the textbook, which really covers the rhetorical material, um, the writing process, paragraphing, organization, things like that. We were able to um, draw on a lot of existing OER, adapt that material, in some cases use it wholesale, or at least just modify it for, for our program. Um, but something that we were able to do that we were really excited about is because we have a standard curriculum, because we have a standard sequence of assignments that our students have to complete, no published textbook out there is going to be able to speak to those assignments in a perfect way. And that's always been part of the dissatisfaction of having to choose a published textbook. But we were able to create chapters specifically on the specific essay assignments that our students have to complete. So we know that we're giving them exactly the information that they need to be successful in our writing program. So it was a really wonderful experience to write those chapters. Uh, at the end of the textbook, we also wanted to create a reading anthology because in college composition, students have to read pretty widely. Um, academic nonfiction, prose writing, these are, the, these are the texts that students write their essays about. Um, so we worked with our librarians to put together a reading anthology. These are all texts um, that are available through our library's databases. And so we created a topical reading anthology, um, sections on education, on media literacy, on um, uh, gender issues, uh, all sorts of issues um, uh, that instructors can choose from. And, and each of those sections has readings that students are able to access full text through our library databases. And then the instructors who found these readings also crafted reading questions and assignment prompts that instructors could give to their students to help them engage with the material. Um, finally, this, the last section of the textbook that we're still working on developing is, that, is an anthology of student writing. So the students will be able to see example exemplary um, essays written by students uh, uh, writing to the, the, the same you know, writing prompts that future students are going to be encountering in these courses. 
Um, we just have uh, one sample student essay up there right now. This is a section that we're hoping to grow um, because every year we give out a composition writing award to some of our um, to some of our outstanding composition students. And so we'll be asking all those winners if they will um, uh, allow us to post their essays here in the OER. And so that's a great way for students to be able to contribute to this uh, to this text as well. Um, so feel free to take a look at the OER and if you have any questions about it, please let me know. Um, I feel like I could talk for hours about the process of writing this because my colleagues and I lived and breathed um, this for, as I said, three years. Um, it was a big undertaking, but I really wanted to um, think of just uh, three key terms or, or three main points that I wanted to make about the process of writing the OER. And the first key term I wanted to put out there was um, mentorship. And that sounds like um, what everybody else on this panel was able to get through their participation in the grant program. Um, and my committee didn't participate in the grant program. And so we had to find mentors in another way. Um, but luckily, uh, leading up to this project, I attended a couple regional and national conferences where I saw some faculty speaking about their own experience creating OER. And very luckily, a couple of those panels of faculty were right here in Ohio. Um, one of them uh, included Mandy Goodset, and I think Melanie Gagich is on the, the call here today too. And so um, these were two of our, our most prized OER mentors. We learned so much from them. They were willing to come to LCC's campus and reprise the, uh, uh, the presentation that they gave. I believe it was, it was at four C's. Um, so, so that the faculty at, at my college could learn about their experience and begin to wrap our heads around what it means to be an OER for a whole writing program. Um, and then there was a similar group of faculty from Columbus State University, or Columbus State um, Community College who, who came uh, to give us a presentation as well. And so we owe these folks so much because they told us um, about their experience and gave us a sense, not only of how to do this, but um, they, they allowed us to believe in ourselves that we could also do it too because of um, once we did undertake that, the second key term that I wanted to share is collaboration. Um, we, you know, I wasn't working alone on this OER. I was part of a committee of faculty. Um, and from the beginning, um, we wanted to make sure that this committee included both full-time faculty and our adjunct faculty as well, because most of our composition classes are taught by adjunct faculty. And so they needed to have a voice in this process in creating this text. Um, so the committee um, from the get-go um, included both of those um, both of those um, streams of faculty. We worked with our own librarian throughout. They taught us about um, licensing and, and the ins and outs of using material like that. They helped us um, work on the research chapters to make sure that the information we were sharing with students matched um, with what students need to know to navigate LCC library databases. They helped us create the uh, reading anthology. They were just um, they were just there to support us from the get-go. Um, and then we also reached out regularly to um, the folks in our e-learning offices and our accessibility offices to make sure that the material that we were posting um, was accessible for all students who needed to use it. And so it was a wonderful chance for uh, us as faculty to collaborate not only with each other, but with other units and offices across campus. It was a really great learning experience for us. And I think it made the, uh, the, the OER richer um, for, for doing that. Um, and then the last key term I wanted to share was um, institutional support, because I don't think we could have done any of this without the support of our institution. The Dean of Arts and Humanities was incredible, incredibly supportive from the get-go. Um, and so she made it possible that um, we did receive some funding in order to do this work. Um, it was not a lot of fun funding. It was maybe just sort of a, you know, a, a token gesture. I don't know that it necessarily covered all of the hours that we were putting into it, but it definitely covered some of them. It allowed us to do the work. And most importantly, it allowed our adjunct faculty to do the work. I mean, us full timers may have been able to, you know, just mark it down as another committee that we were on. Um, but without being able to concept or uh, compensate our, our part time instructors to do this work, you know, they wouldn't have been able to be involved. And so that funding was really, really important. Uh, not only during the writing and the launch of the OER, but um, that committee uh, continues to exist and continues to get funding um, from our division, because even now that the OER is launched, um, it is a lot to manage and maintain. Um, we've sent out surveys to instructors and students this last year to see what is working with the OER and what is not. We got a lot of great suggestions back, and so we've been already starting to revise the OER in the second edition. Um, ready for fall. And so we imagine that um, as long as we're able to, we want to keep the committee together so that we can um, continue uh, with this process of, of improving the. Um, 
semester and year by year, institutional support is uh, so necessary to make that happen. So um, that's the information I wanted to share right off, but I'm happy to answer any questions and, and provide any other information in the discussion. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your um, experience. It's amazing to hear what an impact, you know, one course at a at a community, a two year college, you know, it sounds like is is spreading so widely with forty different, you know, sections per year or what or all of those instructors. So it's amazing to hear how widespread uh, this new text will be. So congratulations! I can't wait to check it out, <laughs> and thank you for sharing the experience with us. So we're kind of uh, out of time in terms of sharing. Um, I don't know. I know we had only had till 1245. So I'm not sure, Mandy, if we could take a couple of questions or if you want to. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I'm seeing something in the chat. We've all learned everyone needs a Mandy if they want to uh, get get going on their OER journey. So my hope for you all is that you can find um, a Mandy or a mentor that can help you um, get started on that journey. Um, if there's any questions and you want to pop them in the chat, uh, we could we could try to look uh, at a couple of them. I know um, that we kind of have a break here until the next keynote at 1.30. So if you're able to stick around, great. If you're not, we totally understand. Um, but if you have any questions that you'd like any of the faculty members to answer, um, please pop them in the chat. <laughs> Mandy is blushing. Got a message here. I think you all did such a good job explaining your um, experience that that we don't have a uh, too many questions here. I had a couple on um, that I had written down, but I think it would get us into into a lot of time and discussion that we probably don't have time for. So I'm just gonna pop to. Let's see. I have my email there. So if you do have anything that you'd like to follow up with any of these um, folks about or with me, if you want to know more about the grant program itself and maybe how to do something similar on your own campus or in your state, um, please reach out to me. I love talking about it. It's one of my favorite things to share. So I'm happy to um, tell you anything that we've learned um, and uh, answer any questions you might have. And I want to thank again. Uh, all of these faculty members for sharing their time with us today and also all of the work over the past, you know, several years for some of them, um, you know, the past year for the folks that were in my cohort and all of the work that they continue to do for their students. So thank you.